this evening, which is of the primary interest to us, uh, we're talking about what's next with Iran, the future of their weapons program, and the future of their relations with the West. And as all of us know, um, what is billed as a historic deal with Iran uh, is based upon a tremendous amount of hope and goodwill. And uh, from the standpoint of our speaker, I know scientific good sense as well. The, uh, the debate about it will go on for a while. And certainly the working out of the weapons program will, will take time. And there'll be a constant testing of the system, which has the prospect of expanding to agreements elsewhere in the world as well. So it's in a way an experiment of, about the future as well as a question of the progress of the moment. But it will also be subject, as we all know, to an intense discussion also. And with Iran's varied interests in the Middle East, uh, the tensions uh, in other areas might well be there. So the, this does not guarantee smooth relationships with the West, of course. Uh, our speaker tonight um, <clears throat> is an authority on the nuclear questions. But he's also an authority on the whole problem, in a way. Uh, he, uh, as some of you know from uh, his background, uh, his, he's a graduate of Boston College in psychology, and then laid with honors, and then with high honors from uh, Georgetown, their School of Foreign Service, with an emphasis on national security, and, uh, and spent eight years or so as a congressional uh, staff member, primarily with the Armed Services Committee, but also uh, government operations as well. And then with a series of serious oriented think tank types of organizations. Uh, the Stimson Group, of course, then later was at the Carnegie uh, uh, Institute for Interna International wow. Peace. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and then later uh, with the uh, Center for uh, a New American Progress. Yeah. Um, and at the present, He's with the Plowshares Fund, which has a wonderful name, of course, for very symbolic. Um, all of those organizations had a strong dedication uh, to the question of peace, and usually from a somewhat progressive viewpoint. Uh, the present organization, uh, which our guest has been with, um, was instrumental, or at least very helpful, in the, the last agreements. Uh, it's a funding organization. And they funded a variety of organizations and individuals who brought together great intellectual talent as well as some political influence to this whole process of, of working toward what we call the, the Iran deal. Uh, our guest uh, was an advisor to then Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton. And he's been on the advisory board uh, for Secretary of State Kerry. Yeah. So he, uh, has, and he's, the books that he's written going back a, a, a dozen years or so on the question of the nuclear issues uh, have been impressive. And he's written dozens and dozens of articles since then and dealt with colleagues immersed in this area and uh, commented on it often. Uh, in short, he, he is a, uh, a recognized authority on the question on which he's speaking this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Joseph Serenzioni. <laughs> Nailed it. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Frank, and thank you to the council for inviting me up here. I, there were no notes up here. You did that without a net. You know my resume better than my wife, and she's been with me 35 years, So plus the time we were living together. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure a real pleasure to be in Baltimore in this beautiful location. I have lived in Tacoma Park, Maryland uh, since 1981, raised two kids, many trips to the aquarium, never seen it from this point of view before. It's absolutely, absolutely uh, gorgeous. Um, as, as Frank mentioned, I'm the president of Plowshares Fund. I've been the president there for almost eight years. We're a, 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 what they call a public foundation. Uh, devoted to nuclear policy, to reducing the, the risks of nuclear dangers uh, everywhere, from the existing arsenals to stopping new states from getting these weapons. We, we raise money from uh, generous donors, and then we grant it out 
to people who are working on this. We try to find the smartest people with the best ideas of how to reduce these nuclear risks. So if you either have money or need money, please see me after. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> and as also as Frank mentioned, I am a progressive, and I'm happy to talk about what a progressive is <laughs> and have that debate with you. I, I spent uh, two years at the Center for American Progress. That's the think tank that John Podesta founded. Uh, and, uh, and I was vice president for national security there before coming. So I'm very familiar with the Clinton camp. I was an Obama supporter while I was there, so I would sit with the one or two others by the water cooler and talk <laughs> while the Clinton people ran the organization. Um, I now give advice uh, to anybody who asks. So I've, I've, I've talked um, with some of the campaigns. Um, about what nuclear policy should be. I, well, just right before, I was a little late coming because I was finishing up a, a memorandum for Senator Sanders. His staff approached us and asked some questions about nuclear policy and what the budget is and what we're doing. So I did a memo for them. We're hoping also to talk to uh, Senator, to uh, Governor Kasich, who I knew when he was a congressman, a freshman on the House Armed Services Committee, where I made my bones. That's where I learned really how a bill becomes a law. Uh, so that's enough about my past. I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A or maybe some of us over dinner tonight. But what we're going to talk about now is certainly one of the most debated foreign policy issues uh, in, in recent American history. And this is the deal with Iran, the nuclear deal. And I want to tell you first what that deal is, what it actually does, what the politics are around the deal, and then what this means for the broader geopolitical situation in the Middle East, and what the debate is here now about it, and what that says about the foreign policy choices we, we face. I was a proponent for the deal. As president of Plowshares, we gave grants to people who wanted to find a diplomatic solution to the deal. We thought the worst of all possible outcomes could be either Iran with a bomb, or a war that tried to stop Iran from getting the bomb, or both. Because in our calculation, if we started a war to try to take out Iran's uh, nuclear capabilities that would, in fact, damage their facilities, we can do this. We have the most powerful military in the world. We could level, in a way that Israel never could, Iran's nuclear facilities. As, as Robert Gates, then Secretary of Defense, says, then what? And the what was very troubling. And the what included that Iran's reaction to that. Remember, you can't, in war, make the fallacy of the last move. Think that you get the last move in this game. You don't. The other side gets a move, and there were many, many things that Iran could do to strike back on us that could make the war in Iraq look like a warm-up act. And the worst part was, as Secretary Gates said, and then Secretary Panetta, and then Secretary Hagel, and then Secretary Carter, they all have the same opinion because this comes from our intelligence assessments. The most we could do in such an attack is set the program back two or three years, and then they would rebuild. And in our estimation, an attack by the United States or Israel on Iran's nuclear facility would end all debate inside Iran about whether they should go for the bomb or not. And it would be pedal to the metal, and they would get a nuclear bomb faster than if we did nothing at all. So from our point of view, the only way to stop Iran from getting a bomb was the diplomatic track. Fortunately, the President of the United States thought that too. They weren't sure they could get it, but they thought it was worth a shot. As he said repeatedly, and as our, joint sh uh, as our military leader said repeatedly, we have to exhaust all, op all non-military options before turning to the military option. So we funded experts to do studies on this. You have to have a sound analysis of the nuclear program, what's the threat, what's the progress, what's its trajectory, looking at the costs and benefits of military actions, looking at what you can do with sanctions to try to inform the public and government debate. We also helped fund advocates, people who would push this point of view up on Capitol Hill, media experts who would help publicize this. Just to be completely transparent on this, over the last five years, we then organized these people in a campaign where we were the the network for them to bring these people together to, arg to argue the merits of the deal, to synergize their efforts together, and then to 
support the deal once it was arrived at and we approved of it, we liked it, to go support that deal and help convince Congress to uh, not kill the deal. We knew we couldn't get Congress to actually approve it, but the trick was not to get them uh, to, to kill it. We spent about $12 million in that effort over five years, raising and spending it, and that became a big part of what we did over the last five years. So that's my bias. That's where I stand on this deal, and let me now tell you why. Once you decide that the military option is a losing option, and you decide that there has to be a diplomatic solution, you have to arrive at an agreement. There was no option for sanctioning Iran into submission. No country has ever been sanctioned into compliance, ever. And we put on Iran the most onerous sanction regime that has ever been placed on a country outside of war. And it worked. It didn't work to get them to do what we want. It didn't work to get them to surrender. That's not what sanctions do. It worked to get them back to the bargaining table. It crippled their economy. The sanctions cut their oil exports in half. They were exporting about 2.3 million barrels a day, and when the sanctions really took hold, they were dropped to about a million. It froze their overseas bank accounts. We'll get back to this, but you, you know that 150 billion you've heard about? It's not our money, it's their money going in as dollars to overseas bank accounts, we froze the bank accounts. We cut off their access to international trading. You want some money, you go to the ATM machine, you put your card in, it sends an electronic signal, bang, you get your money. Iran can't do that. Iran can't electronically, or couldn't until recently, transfer their funds from their banks, from their financial institutions, to overseas banks, any place outside the country, we cut them off. This was tough, we don't, and it wasn't just we. The beauty of this approach was that the whole world was with us. And the whole world was with us because the way Obama played it. You remember, almost eight years ago, on that freezing cold day on the, on, on the, the mall in Washington, a million, two million people came out to hear him, and in that speech he talked about Iran. He extended the hand of friendship, he said. If you will open your fist, we, will have, we can have relations with you. We can do business with you. Well, Iran didn't open its fist. It didn't accept the president's offer. And so, but the world understood that now we had a president who was seeking a diplomatic solution, that we weren't the problem, that we were willing to talk, we were negotiating, Iran wasn't, and that's what let us, let us go to the UN and get UN sanctions passed on them. We discovered their secret facilities you maybe, maybe you remember back in 2009, so the first year Obama's in office, he's at a global summit that we're having, and there he reveals the news that we've discovered a, a new underground facility that Iran is building deep in the mountains at what we call Fordo, outside the holy city of Qom. They said we weren't doing it, we weren't doing it, they were doing it. They have a history of cheating on agreements, we have a history of catching them. So we caught them in open, released the pictures, showed it, embarrassed their closest supporters, so even China and Russia had to come support these U new UN sanctions on, on Iran. And that's what made them feel the pain. Not just our sanctions, the global sanctions, and we kept it up until they came back to the bargaining table, until we got a deal. So then you go to the bargaining table and you deal. We want everything, they want to give nothing. Well, that's negotiations, right? You want a 2% rate on your mortgage, the bank wants 12. Let's talk, you know, you shop around. So this is a negotiation, whether it's labor and, and, and management, you and the bank, the, the, the six countries that were in these talks in Iran, because this was not US negotiating with Iran, this was what they called the P5 plus one. So it's the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, that's the US and the UK, France, Russia, and China, plus Germany, because this had originally been, an, been a European Union initiative. The Europeans call it the EU 3 plus 3, we call it the P5 plus 1. It's still six countries negotiating with Iran, and that also gave us power. As you know, it's tough to get the agreement among all six nations, but when you do, they got no place to go. 
So these negotiations went on for, for quite some time. They started in September of 2013, um, when, and they were made possible by the election of a pragmatic figure in Iranian politics. So Ahmadinejad, the, the president, the Holocaust-denying, rabble-rousing, radical president of Iran, he was gone. In June 2013, the Iranians elect uh, Hassan Rouhani. He was not supposed to win. He was not the choice of the ruling elite. He was not the choice of the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. There were five other candidates on there, all machine guys, all the Ayatollah's guys. Rouhani outpolls all of them together, wins in, an, in, in, a, in a landslide. He is the most reformist-minded president. I, 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 wouldn't call, I, I wouldn't call him a reformer. I wouldn't call him a moderate. He's a pragmatist. He represents the pragmatic wing of the Iranian elite. And I want to tell you just a little bit about him and what's going on so you understand the dynamics of the negotiations. Because just as this negotiation was violently debated here, it was violently debated in Iran. Iran was just as split, maybe more so, than we were. Because here, people can lose their job, lose their office, lose a debate. There, they could lose their life. There, they could be, end up in prison. There, their families can be targeted for taking positions against the government. But there was a big disagreement between the hardliners, the so-called Revolutionary Guard faction, the faction that wants revolution, that sees the Islamic revolution that they believe they started in 1970, and they want to continue that. They want to export it. They want to aid proxy groups in the Middle East. And then there's the group that Rouhani represents. And that's what I would call the pragmatist wing. I had dinner with him in New York twice, 2013 and 2014. And I met him in Tehran when he was the nuclear negotiator and the one time I was in Tehran in 2005. And there were two things in those conversations in, in New York that struck me. These were a small group of about 25 Americans um, foundation leaders, uh, think tank leaders, and, and, and Mr. Rouhani. And it, it was off the record, but he said things there that we also said publicly, so let me share them with you so you understand his mindset. And the first was about, he was pressed on why we were just talking about the nuclear deal, because the negotiations had just been announced. This was September 2013. And why didn't we go and talk about all the issues that separated us? The relations with Israel, the, rela the support for Haba Hamas and Hezbollah, why we call them a state sponsor of terrorism. Human rights, There's a, their relations with the Sunni states, the Saudi Arabia. Let's put all this on the table in the parlance of negotiations. Let's go big for big. Let's reach a comprehensive agreement the way Nixon struck with Mao back in 1972, a big you know, a version of the Shanghai communique. And Rouhani says, the history of U.S.-Iran relations is very complicated. The table won't bear the weight of all these issues at once. I love the way these guys talk. The table won't bear the weight of all these issues at once. We have to take one step and in so doing build confidence that we can take the next two and so on and so on. And both sides have agreed to start with the nuclear. What we didn't know at that point was that there had been secret talks that had been going on between the US and Iran, uh, mediated by the Sultan of Oman earlier, all during that year. And this, in fact, had been the case. We agreed to start with this. It's the most important. It's the most divisive. It's the most international. We can't do anything else with Iran until we solve this issue. So this was the focus. The other thing he said, which helped me understand his motives and con was confirmed by people who know a lot more about Iran than I do, was that he believed that in thir within 30 years, Iran could be the 10th largest economic power in the world. And there's a lot of experts who agree with that. Iran is a country of 80 million people. It is an educated, you might say, heavily middle class in the Middle East context, society. It's, the only, it's got an industrial base. It's the only country in the Middle East that builds cars. They build a million a year. 
You know, they don't build cars in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia wants to build a bridge, they hire a foreign company. No, Iran is a real nation with a 3,000 year history. So the, the Rouhani wing wants the power that comes from a powerful economy, not the illusory power that comes from nuclear weapons. In order to build that economy, they had to end the sanctions. In order to end the sanctions, they had to give up their nuclear program, or at least assure us that it was not being used to build nuclear weapons. So that's his motivation for going in. That's the deal we try to strike. But we don't strike a deal depending on what we think the other guy wants. We strike a deal on what gives us assurance that you are meeting our terms, and the terms where we had to block every pathway to the bomb. Every way you could possibly build a bomb, we got to stop it and be sure that it's stopped in our field, it's verifiable. And this is what the deal does, and this is why I think it's the strongest non-proliferation agreement ever negotiated in the 70 years of the nuclear age. We don't have pictures or videos to show this. The Iranians were too embarrassed to let people come in and photograph this. I know, because I've been talking to people from NPR, from the, the, the show The World, from, from PBS, from ABC, who wanted to go in and film this. Iranians wouldn't let them come in. But what has happened over the last, we inked the deal July 14th, and since the, in that time, Iran then it went into effect uh, at the end of summer in September. In that period, Iran ripped out two-thirds of its centrifuges. These are the machines that they use to enrich uranium. They took their stockpile of enriched uranium gas and shipped it out of the country. They had 12, 13 tons of it. They're left with 300 pounds of it, a token amount. Not, they can't do much of anything with that. They took out the core of their plutonium reactor, drilled it full of holes, and filled it with concrete, cutting off their pathway to making plutonium that could be used for a bomb. And then they agreed to the most rigorous inspection regime ever negotiated uh, in the nuclear field. We have cameras and seals and locks and inspectors and inventory controls and audits on every part of the Iranian nuclear program, starting from the mine. Every, every, we, this, is the, this is a first. We now have inspectors tracking the Iranian uranium when it comes out of the ground until it's turned into a gas and stored in a warehouse under lock and seal. We have a mechanism set up so if there's some activity going on in a site that, we, that isn't a declared part of their nuclear facility, what we call an undeclared facility that doesn't have inspectors, a garage in northeast Iran, a plant that suddenly appears in the desert, we can put inspectors there within 24 days. This is the famous 24-day thing that you might have heard about. Oh, we can't go in and inspect for 24 days? No, no. We have inspectors 24-7. Every single facility in Iran that has anything to do with the nuclear complex has inspectors 24-7. We're talking about the undeclared facilities, something that pops up. Well, we say we want to go there, and Iran says no. Things like this happen in the nuclear world all the time with all kinds of countries, and they can drag on for years. They can be like Supreme Court cases. They go on forever. The, what the, the innovative part of this agreement was it made a, a set a time limit on it. It's a maximum of 24 days from the time we file a complaint, or any country who's a party to this agreement. It, we have a maximum of 24 days to let the inspectors in. And if they don't, then it goes back to the Security Council. We can pass a resolution, a, a one that cannot be vetoed. I'll explain this how this works later. One that cannot be vetoed at the Security Council to put the sanctions back on. So this, this is a remarkable mechanism. But let me pause for a second, and let's talk. I'm going to give you a little nuclear lesson about what we're talking about, if you don't mind, just so you understand this. This all started because in 2003, we found out that Iran was secretly building a centrifuge plant. Now, centrifuges are machines that are about the size of your water heater. They're made of... Uh, high-tech materials, very delicate machines. Not many countries could make it. Iran got the design from our ally, Pakistan, AQ Khan, 
who had been the father of the Pakistan nuclear program, sold Iran and Libya and some other countries the designs for the centrifuges, the initial parts for the centrifuges, in, in the case of Libya, entire kits of centrifuges, like a bicycle, getting ready to assemble. Libya was like the dad trying to assemble the <laughs> centrifuge on Christmas morning. They couldn't do it. So when we made the deal with Libya and the Bush administration to give up their centrifuge program, we're still in the crates. All those crates are now in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I'll come back to those crates in a minute. Iran, however, is these, these people, this is, I'm telling you, this is an advanced country. They know how to do this stuff. They're great engineers. They started building the centrifuges. They started modifying them. They started building better ones than the, than the Pakistani design. And when we found out, we, we, this is when we cracked down, because they said, don't worry, we're just using it to make fuel. Here's the problem. Centrifuges take uranium gas. The Iranians have uranium mines. They pull the uranium out of the earth. They mill it to get rid of the impurities. It forms like a powder, yellowish in cover, which is what color, which is why they call it yellow cake. They take that yellow cake, they combine it with a gas, a fluorine gas, so now it's a gaseous form, highly toxic, highly volatile, and you take that gas, it's called uranium hexafluoride, you take that gas and you put it in the centrifuges because you need to purify it, because you're trying to purify it to get a higher concentration of the particular isotope of uranium that you can use to make energy, either energy for peaceful purposes or energy for a bomb, U-235. Uranium is the heaviest element in the, it found on Earth. It's the end of the line. There's nothing heavier than this naturally formed. U-235 is that, is that atom where if you fire a neutron at it, it splits in half, forms two other atoms, krypton and barium. There really is a krypton. <laughs> but you don't care about that. What you care about is that it shoots out two other neutrons. So if there's if there's another isotope of U-235, another atom of U-235 nearby, that, that neutron will hit it and split that and release two more neutrons on average. You get the picture, one, two, four, eight. That's your chain reaction. The trick is to get the 235 close enough together. And the problem you have is that naturally uranium, there's too little of it. Less than 1% of that uranium is 235. So you've got to enrich it so that it's enriched to a higher ratio of 235, that's what the centrifuges are for. You with me so far? Yeah. Good. So you spin the uranium gas around at really supersonic speed, which is why they have to be high tech, high alloy. You can't do this in your heater. You know, high strength magnets, very delicate things. And as every chemistry student knows, the heavier particles, elements, go to the outside. The lighter ones stay inside. The 238, which is what most of the uranium is, goes to the outside. The 235 stays inside. You siphon off a little bit of that gas. Now you have a slightly higher ratio, a few more atoms of 235 in that mixture, but it's not enough. So you hook it up to another centrifuge, and you do it again, and again, and again, and you have this cascade of 10,000 centrifuges, 20,000 centrifuges, 50,000 centrifuges. You do that for three months. Now you can stop the process and you've got 3.5% enriched. 3.5% of the atoms in that gas are U-235, that's close enough. You take it out, you turn it into a powder, you put the powder into pellets, you put the pellets in fuel rods, you put the fuel rods in your nuclear reactor, the, combust the chain reaction starts, it's controlled, the energy comes off, it's heat, the heat turns the water into steam, the steam turns the turbines, and bang, Electricity. Twenty percent of all the electricity in the United States is produced in exactly that way. Twenty percent of the electricity we have in the United States is nuclear energy. Great. The problem is, if you keep those centrifuges going, we can figure the plumbing a little bit, be very careful how you do it, you could just keep enriching. You can go to twenty percent, fifty percent, ninety percent. Same machines, same facilities. When you get to 90%, now you can take out that gas, you can form it into a metal, you can turn that metal into two hemispheres, put them at the opposite sides of a pipe, fire one hemisphere into the other, and you have Hiroshima. That's the Hiroshima bomb. Needs somewhere around 100 pounds of 90% pure uranium, and you have a bomb. 
that any graduate engineering student could build. There's no secret to how to build a nuclear bomb. The problem is having the stuff. The Iranians say, Iranians say, we're just using this to make fuel. See our reactor at Bushir? We're just using it to make fuel. Do you trust them? Obviously, we do not. Obviously, we do not. So we wanted them to give up the entire program. They refused. The best deal would have been if they got rid of everything. But we're not Rome, and they're not Carthage. And we couldn't scrape it. There was no price that, would agree, that they would agree to do that. So we, they, it was a, in part, it was a source of pride. They had invested billions in this. It became a national rallying cry. The public supported the program for peaceful uses. So we shrunk it down. Two-thirds of the centrifuges. They had 20,000. They have 5,000 now. There's another 1,000 that aren't operating. Strictly limited. Instead of multiple places, one place. Highly controlled. And you limit the supply of the gas itself. So by shrinking it from tons of uranium gas in Stockwell down to 300 pounds, that in of itself extends the time that if all failed, if they cheated, if they broke out of the agreement, it would take them at least a year to start get everything up and running and make enough for one bomb. When we were negotiating the agreement, it was a matter of weeks. You remember Mr. Netanyahu on the podium with his bomb, the red line? He was talking about they were weeks away from being able to quickly make enough material for a bomb. That was his red line. When they got up there, that's when he said Israel was going to have to attack in polite language of the UN, but in more blunt language in his cabinet meetings. We've drained that bomb. There, not only is there no more 20 percent, there's no more anything. There's just this 300 pounds, and there's strict limits. They can't go above 3.5 percent. Can't. This deal lasts, most of the provisions last for 15 years. Limits on the numbers of centrifuges, on the types of centrifuges. You can't replace them with more modern centrifuges. Limits on the amount of gas they're supposed to have. There are other limits that go out 20, 25 years, like our control over the mine, control over, we set up a special procurement channel. So everything they buy in the world for the nuclear program, because we're still allowed to do some research, still allowed to operate those centrifuges, as few as they are, has to go through a special procurement channel so we know what they're buying. And if we find out that Company A up in uh, Isfahan has bought a widget that's on that list and that's, bang, that's a violation. You ha everything has to go through this one channel. And some of the agreement are like diamonds. It la they last forever. The inspection regime lasts forever. The ban on them ever building a nuclear weapon lasts forever. So that's what they've signed up for. By our estimate, we've set the program back a generation. We bought time. At the end of that 15 years, could they decide they want to build 50,000 centrifuges? Could they build up a big stockpile? Yes, they could. Would that be a problem for us? Yes, it would but we have at least 15 years before then and time to do other things. It depends how we use that time. What else happens? What else happens in the regime? People are working right now to try to put a cap on anybody going above 3.5%, so that when Iran emerges at the end of 15 years out of this set of restrictions, they will come into a world of such restrictions, that everybody in the world should have the inspection regime that Iran has that everybody in the world should agree to special procurement channels. So we should, this Iran agreement has become a model of what we'd like everybody to do. And what's the relationship like between the U.S. and Iran? That's the other key factor. What would be their motive for going further? What's their relationship like with their neighbors? What's their motive for going further? Have we solved some of the conflicts? Have we solved some of the tensions? What's happened inside Iran? Now, none of the nuclear agreement is based on any of those things t panning out the way we want. I was talking beforehand to some, some people. It's a sucker's game to try to negotiate agreement expecting the regime is going to change. Just look at what's happened with North Korea. We've been thinking that regime is going to change any day now. It's been there 70 years. But Iran is a very dynamic political situation. 
three numbers. 70% of the population is under the age of 35, and they have a 40% unemployment rate. Whoa, right? That is a ticking time bomb. No country can survive that unless they're a dictatorship like North Korea. This is not a dictatorship like North Korea. This is a country where the population is hungry for change. Anybody who's gone to Iran sees it. You go to Iran, and when they find you an, you're an American, they can't get enough of you. They love America. We are hugely, hugely <laughs> popular in Iran, much more popular than we are in Pakistan, our ally, where they hate us. You go to Iran, everybody who's been to Iran will tell you this. They want to know, they tell you stories about when they were, worked on the Air Force Base or their, their cousins in, 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 in Los Angeles or they watch TV shows. They, they want to talk to you about the cinema, about the latest music. Can you help them get a visa? <laughs> the kids are riding around in Vespers with dungarees and iPods. iPods, that dates me. iPhones. <laughs> they want what we have. They know what we have, and that's what they want. That's a lot of pressure. Doesn't mean it's going to succeed, but that's the struggle that's going on inside Iran right now. And that's why so many of the hardliners opposed the deal, because they saw this as an opening to the West. It's true. This deal allows Iran back in. It starts to, it's a deal that in some ways legitimizes the regime, and this is why many people were opposed to it. They didn't want to make any deal with Iran, anything that would legitimize the regime. They wanted to overthrow the regime. This deal doesn't do that. This, this deal brings them back in a little bit. And the hope is that that can be to our advantage. So companies are streaming back in. Iran is open for business again. Peugeot is coming back to help them make cars. We're trying to sell them airplane parts. The American businesses can't do business with Iran. There's still sanctions on us. The rest of the world can do business, with one exception, and that's the airline, aircraft industry. A lot of their planes are American-made. In fact, in 2005, when I was there, they asked a, the small group of Americans who were at this conference whether we wanted to go to Isfahan, where they had this uranium conversion plant, where they turned that yellow cake into a gas. We said, sure. So four or five of us went on this plane. We were a Boeing 707. That's an old plane. And we're sitting at the tarmac, and I'm looking out at these GE engines, and I'm really rethinking our sanctions policy. <laughs> really? Where am I going now? <laughs> Short flight. <laughs> um, so the aircraft industry is one of the exceptions that we, we built into this. We have released their, so what do they get out of it? They did all this destruction. They took down their, their thing. What they get out of it is the end of the sanctions, so all the businesses goes in, and there's a matter of that money that's been sitting in, in bank accounts. I'm gonna stop in just a few minutes. It's not 150 billion, it's 100 billion. State Department says it's 100 billion, it's now released, but about half of that amount, there's the equivalent of liens on it. The government, and, in whose countries some of these banks are, have outstanding claims on Iran worth about 50 billion, and this includes countries like China. So it's not a country you're gonna push aside and blow them off. So the estimate is from the Treasury Department that about half that money is gonna be siphoned off for, for um, to pay those debts. So that gives them 50 billion they could use. Can they use that to fund terrorist activities? Possibly, it's their money, it's fungible. It'll go into the system. The Treasury Department says, and a lot of independent economists, uh, economists agree with this, that Iran has such unmet uh, infrastructure needs that they desperately need that money to build up their, their infrastructure. The uh, estimate is they have about 500 to 600 billion dollars of infrastructure needs, including about 125 billion for their oil industry. It's in a state of disrepair. The sanctions have crippled not just the sale, but the actual facilities themselves. And they, in order to make more money, they gotta invest money into those facilities and get them up and running again, bring them up to standard. So we'll see. The money's just been released. This is something to track. What happens? Do you see this? And I'm gonna close on this. Here's the bigger picture. If this works, if Rouhani survives, 
There's elections at the end of this month for, for their equivalent of their parliament. His people are running, the hardliners are running, let's see what happens. There's other elections that are happening this month. He's up for re-election next year, 2017. If he survives and this policy consolidates, it's quite possible that in the process, Iran opens up and starts to make other arrangements with us over areas of mutual strategic interest. Not because they're doing us a favor, not because they're nice guys, but because they get something too. We want to stabilize Iraq, so do they. We want to defeat ISIS, so do they. We want to stabilize Afghanistan, so do they. Remember, the Taliban was their enemy before they were our enemy. Al-Qaeda was their enemy before they were our enemy. The Iraqi government's an ally of Iran's now. They want to end the war in Syria, so do we. We have different ways we think we should end it, but there's a mutual interest. It is not in their interest to have greater instability in the Middle East. Some people think it is. I disagree. It's in their ability. It's in their interest, just like China, to have an extended period of peace and stability in the region so they can grow their economy. That's their plan. So can we meet in these areas of overlapping strategic interests? Let's find out. Let's find out. Including the possibility of eventually restoring diplomatic relations. We're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have diplomatic relations with them. Everybody else does. All our NATO allies do. We don't because of the hostage crisis. Ronald Reagan came close to restarting them, but didn't, that didn't work out. Others have tried, didn't work out. This might be. It's, I think it's in our interest to have an embassy back in Iran. I think it's in our interest to understand more of what they're doing, to have better intelligence. Finally, in case you think that there's some way that Iran can cheat on this agreement and we won't know about it, the Israelis don't think so. <laughs> I know Mr. Netanyahu was the chief opponent to this, but there's a split between the political grouping in Israel right now and the military and the intelligence grouping in Israel. So the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, they believe that this deal reduces the Iranian threat for at least a decade or more. The in Israeli Atomic Energy Commission just released a report a couple of months ago in endorsing the agreement, saying that it gave us a high confidence that we could detect any violations, that this set the program back, that it reduces the Iranian threat. So when you look at the military intelligence leadership in Israel, they think that this deal is a solid deal and can give us, has the tools built into it to let us detect any violations. So we'll see. There continues to be a fierce debate in the Congress about this. Every week, there's a senator introducing some new bill, some new amendment to try to overturn it. You see what's happening in the political campaigns, tear up the agreement on day one. That debate is also happening in Iran, so this thing is very much in motion. This, is going to be, this deal is going to be with us and be controversial for at least the next couple of years. If everything works out, it'll solidify, and we may start to see some benefits. And I don't mean just releasing the American prisoners. I don't mean just quickly being able to settle a conflict with the seizure of our sailors that could have led to war. I mean some arrangements. One last thing that Rouhani said in one of these units, we have to learn how to manage our differences. He chose his words very carefully. Not resolve our differences, not overcome our differences, manage our differences. That's the end state we're looking for, where we can manage these differences in a diplomatic way, prevent war, and make our country and the region and our allies safer. I believe this agreement does it. Thank you for giving me the time to explain to you why. Well, I'm sorry, that wasn't 25 minutes. Well, I'm sorry, I took up a lot of time in my filibuster. Let's go to questions. The question is, we can expect that the battle between the hardliners and the pragmatists will continue for some time in Iran. What, how, what, do we look, what are the prospects for how that, pros, that battle plays out? Who do we think is going to win? Well, we see it already. The, the hard, this is, Iran is such an interesting government. The supreme leader, Khamenei, is not a dictator. It's not like Saddam Hussein or Kim Jong-un. He's more, they sometimes call him the, the supreme moderator. He tries to moderate the different factions in Iran. Remember, the supreme leader is elected. There's actually a, a grouping that elects the supreme leader. It's called the Council of, uh, of Experts. And that, in turn, is elected. 
so it's a it, it's all the elite, but this is their mechanism for resolving the, the differences. It's not I wouldn't call this a popular election. Rouhani, the man who made the deal, doesn't control the country. The foreign, the interior, for example, the justice mechanism is under the control of the hardliners. These are the guys that are picking people up the street that are arresting Iranian Americans. The ones that were just released, they were uh, arrested and held by that uh, elite. So th there's got to be that by that hard hardliners. So that's part of the struggle. They didn't have any interest in making smoothing things open. They don't want a bigger opening. They don't want to relax the religious laws. They don't want to give the kids more control. They don't want to have a more popular democracy. They don't want to give up economic control. In many ways, the Revolutionary Guard benefited from the sanctions because they controlled the smuggling operations. So every time a new Porsche showed up in the streets of Tehran, somebody was getting paid off. The Revolutionary Guard was making money. So they're not really interested. And even in the... The, 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 there's such a penetration in the economy by these hardline groups, by the, by the Revolutionary Guard in particular, that even the economic reconstruction will probably benefit them in some way. And of course, Rouhani's trying to use that to his benefit, trying to give the Revolutionary Guard an economic incentive to participate in the reconstruction, to the ending of sanctions, to the opening to the West. Um, I, when you look at Iran from the outside, you think, how can this regime last? It can't. It's not giving the people what they want, with the exception of stability. And this is the changing factor that cautions some people from thinking a new era is going to bloom in Iran, that the regime's number, days are numbered. The Middle East is collapsing. Iran is a stable nation, relatively speaking, in that region. Henry Kissinger says that if Iran modifies its behavior, so does less intervention in its neighbor's affairs, we should be open to, to a dialogue with Iran because we need Iran to, stop, to help stop the collapse of the region. This is a dual-edged sword. On the one hand, you do need their help. You want to end the war in Syria? Iran's got to be involved. You want to stop the civil war in Yemen? Iran's got to be involved. You want to get a Middle East peace between Israel and the Palestinians? Iran can't get you that peace, but not involving them can pretty much guarantee you won't get it. But in so doing, you help continue the government in its present form. So you will be giving them some legitimacy. This is the problem you have. So. I don't know anybody who's willing to predict what's going to happen in Iran, what the forces are. And meanwhile, you have a very serious human rights situation in Iran, and the human rights advocates that we worked with were in favor of the nuclear deal because they saw this as an opening. They saw this as empowering Rouhani, who has promised to improve human rights. But the opposite has happened since the deal. There's been a clampdown on human rights. More people have put in prison. Rouhani hasn't gotten that political space yet. So it's an ongoing battle with, with, with no, but, but it, it, it's a much more complicated people battle than most people uh, un understand. I, I hope this little talk has given you some insight to the, that, that their political system is at least as complex as ours. <laughs> yeah. What is it like to be a woman in Iran? I'll tell you, some of the Iranian American women I know, uh, We'll often refer back to uh, magazines, photos of the 70s. <coughs> Under the Shah, there was a brutal dictatorship. It was also one of the most liberal governments and countries in, in the world. Uh, most of the uh, Iranian women that I know don't want this regime. They want it to go. Uh, there are harsh restrictions on um, on their appearances, <coughs> unlike Saudi Arabia, they can actually drive, they can hold jobs, they can have professorships. Um, so it's not as repressive as the, the Saudi Arabian interpretation of, of Muslim law, but it is still highly restrictive uh, of American women, of, of Iranian women. So you are limited. You are limited. I mean, so a man can't shake a woman's hand, for example. Uh, I think it's, yeah, a little over. 
50 percent of the population has has limit has constrained rights. I wouldn't say no rights, but constrained rights. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And it's. Uh, this isn't my area, but I think it's actually worse in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but Saudi Arabia is an ally, so we don't bring it up too much. But this is a general problem with this theocratic regimes. It's not Arab regimes. It's not Muslim regimes. I was, you've been in Indonesia or Malaysia, Muslim governments. It's not. It's the theocracy. It's this particular interpretation that has a hold on many of the governments in the Middle East, and it's a problem for all of them. Yes, sir, and back. The question is, while we're trying to enforce this regime, doesn't the Revolutionary Guard have a high incentive to sabotage the regime? And the answer is absolutely yes. I would say we saw a small portion of that um, with the seizure of the American sailors. So this could have gone many different ways. The, 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 it's almost the Revolutionary Guard runs the naval forces. So they're probably the ones who, who grabbed the uh, the sailors. There could have been a quick release. There was not. They did, as you know, it's against the Geneva Conventions, it's against the rules, even though we have violated them too, to show pictures of our sailors in those humiliating postures, hands behind their head, on their knees. There was no reason to do that. This was clearly not a threat. And there was no reason to spread photos about them. I think that's a, you, you, what you saw was exactly what the Revolutionary Guard was trying to do poke us in the eye with a stick, maybe stir things up. The remarkable thing is that they were released in 15 hours. So the higher authority said, no, let these guys go. And that is in part because of what's changed. Whatever else happens with this deal, our relationship with Iran has changed. Before September 13th, a US Secretary of State had never talked with the Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, never. Now they're Facebook friends. <laughs> Kerry, I got to tell you, we are real lucky that John Kerry's our Secretary of State. I mean, that is a remarkable job that he did personally with the president's policy, but he did it. And he spent 14 days in that last round staying in, in, in Vienna to hammer out this agreement. And he called Zarif up right away with that seizure and started moving the levers right away. And so that kind of personal relationship, that's what you need to get over these things that the Revolutionary Guard is going to do, but I'm still worried about it. Maybe the next thing they do is not seize prisoners. It's fire a warning shot at a US naval ship that hits us. And then what happens? So yeah, the Revolutionary Guard is still out to, to we have senators passing bills. We have the Revolutionary Guard doing their own maneuvers to try to kill the deal. I'll keep my answer shorter. Yes, sir. What's the possibility of uh, compromise between Israel and Iran? I, I, currently slim. Currently slim. However, there is a long relationship between Israel and Iran um, where Israel has sided with Iran. Israel sold weapons to Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. You may remember the Iran-Contra scandal in the 80s. This involved Israel mediating on our behalf with Iran. So it's not like this is a permanent, built-in, genetic uh, uh, conflict. It's possible that, that it, Israel and Iran will see that there are some mutual interests that require cooperation. It has happened in the past. It could happen again. Uh, I would say achieving a two-state solution is not in the cards for the near future. In the back, ma'am. Does our organization have any interest in or invest any money in, Iran, in um, Israel's development of nuclear weapons? Right. One of the things about this is Israel felt threatened by the possibility that Iran would have, uh, could get nuclear weapons. Israel has, uh, in my personal estimate, about 100 nuclear weapons. Some people think it's a little less. They, had, they deploy them on three different delivery systems. They have missiles that can hit any place in the region. They have aircraft, F-15s, F F-16s, a tornado aircraft that can carry nuclear weapons. And they have submarines that they bought from Germany that carry what we believe are nuclear-tipped uh, submarine launch cruise missiles. Um, so they are the nuclear power in the region. We, I believe that eventually Israel has to give up those nuclear weapons. I want to see a reduction in everyone's nuclear arsenal. We have the most nuclear weapons. We in Russia have the most nuclear weapons in the world. U.S. and Russia have about 90, 
94, 95% of all the weapons in the world, but Israel has 100, the United Kingdom has 100, France has about two, 350, China about 250. I believe those nuclear weapons are a danger to their own people where they are, accidental launch. And also, if you want to end up in a Middle East where no one has these weapons, eventually Israel's got to take the bomb out of the basement and put it on the table. But that is only going to happen in the context of a general peace resolution. You can't expect a country to do this when they feel as threatened as Israel feels right now. So we are beginning to make grants in this region uh, on what we call conflict resolution, not to get Israel to give up the weapons, but to see if there's some way to resolve what is probably the most intractable problem uh, in the Middle East. The question is, what, what about Iran's ballistic missiles, or for that matter, South Korea's ballistic missiles? But a, a long-range ballistic missile makes no military sense with a conventional warhead. So isn't the fact that they're testing longer-range ballistic missiles a sign that they want to weaponize them? The answer is yes, absolutely. We'd be an idiot to think otherwise. Now, they, Iran has short-range missiles. Perfectly legitimate. Uh, Israel has short-range missiles. You use this in warfare. I Iran was attacked by scuds from Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. They built up a counterforce. They have medium-range missiles that they built. But what they're testing, and in fact, there may be a launch soon. They've just issued uh, what they call a, a, a notum, a, 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 a notice to, um, to, to uh, aviation uh, that there might be a launch at the end of February of what they call space launch vehicle, just like what North Korea did. A space launch vehicle is not an ICBM. You can't just put a warhead on it, but it teaches you a lot about ICBMs. It has applicable technologies to ICBMs. We don't want them to do that. There are UN resolutions against them doing that. There are sanctions that we still have on, uh, on Iran to, to try to stop them from doing that. Without a nuclear weapon, however, and without the ability to make a nuclear weapon, the, I gotta tell you, the ballistic threat is a little, is less. We're less concerned about it. We don't like it. We don't want it. We understand why they're proceeding with that. Um, there is a legitimate satellite interest in countries like this. North Korea does have an interest in putting satellites up. It's not just about ICBMs. Iran does have an interest in putting satellites up for the same reason we do. You can make money off of these things. And so the lesson here, and this, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to end, the, the lesson here is, is, is what the agreement does and doesn't do. This agreement does not solve all our problems with Iran. It, it, it does not end their support for terrorism. It, it, the deal does not address the ballistic mi missile threat. It is not a cure for cancer. It's not gonna help you shed unwanted pounds. It does one thing and one thing only. It stops them from building a nuclear bomb, and in my book, that's enough. That's plenty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.